Public works departments across the nation are striving to ensure our cities and counties are safer, cleaner, and greener. We are here in San Diego for PWX 2023, a city leading the way to a sustainable future to benefit the health and wealth of our communities. San Diego prioritizes sustainability in all of our capital investments. We prioritize it in um, the services we do. It has really become a part of the city. To discuss this and much more, we're on the ground alongside thousands of public works professionals to share, learn, and engage. I love this conference. You get reinvigorated. You want to do more and more projects, so I'm definitely love it. Loving the vibe. I've enjoyed the, the sessions, the different sessions. The exhibit hall is amazing. A lot of information. A great reminder, refresher of what you need to know, and just another reminder of how much more we need to learn. There's always other solutions. It just kind of takes your breath away. There's so much to see and do. Who doesn't love San Diego? And this is a great event. You can watch it all right here on PWX TV. Welcome back for our third and final show coming to you right here from PWX 2023. This is where the American Public Works Association brings together thousands of highly engaged public works professionals. We've had a blast learning all about the incredible work you are doing, but there's lots more to come today. Today, we take a close look at sustainability with an in-depth interview looking at San Diego's drive to achieve net zero emissions by 2035. To be a leader in public works, you need to be about the people. Uh, leadership is about how we bring out the best in others. How do we bring out the most, best collective action? And we speak to the public works leaders of today and tomorrow as APWA leads the way in the Emerging Leaders Academy. I could not be more proud of this team that we have. We are creating an environment that people just never want to leave. And we'll head out once more as we take a look at what's happening in public works across the nation. And where can you watch it all? PWX TV is on screens throughout the convention center, in select hotels across the city, via the PWX app, on the PWX website, and of course on social media, where you'll find extended versions of interviews, individual clips to share, and much more. First though, we head back onto the exhibit hall floor to take a closer look at some of the tech that's being showcased there. And on that theme of sustainability, we cut up with a few exhibitors for tips on how to electrify your fleet. One of the major challenges, I think, is the upfront cost and complexity to electrify. Um, that's one of the major challenges that we're really trying to help people with. The solutions we have is really to look at uh, the existing fleet, whether it's you know diesel or CNG, trucks, see you know what the expenses are, what the um, truck makeup are, what the routes are, what the loads are, uh, and then look and see how electric could fit in and how we can do the infrastructure, the trucks, and everything as a turnkey service. It's simply uh, knowledge, experience with the machine. People think it's new technology. It's not new technology. So lithium-ion batteries have been out since forever, electric motors, other electric components on the machine. So it's actually not new. The new thing is actually to put this into construction equipment. But the technology uh, driving the machines, the powertrain, is actually not new. Uh, it's a lot of training, uh, experience. So what we're doing is uh, customer stories with customers who have our machines to spread out the news. Yes, it's simply working. The biggest challenge to electrification is uh, making all the electrical products as effective, as productive, and as uh, economical for the users as the uh, fossil fuel ones. Well, our solution is uh, getting the highest quality uh, components, uh, having the highest quality craftsmanship, and uh, providing the best quality service to our customers. Uh, no doubt about it, it's infrastructure, because the matter of fact is, is that there are many places across the country that do not have the traditional infrastructure in place to support 240 volt or even higher EV charging there from that side of things. So this product that we offer is what's called our EV Arc solution. It's a solar off-grid EV charging solution. Um, it's designed to fit within a standard size parking space. So it's a fully standalone, fully off-grid piece of equipment. Again, requires no electrical or grid connections. 
Great tips there from exhibitors. And with more on vehicles, we visited Nashville's Department of Transportation to see how they're working towards zero fatalities on their transportation network. NDOT was created in 2021 to put an emphasis on transportation and multimodal infrastructure. We are a Vision Zero city, so our goal is to get to zero fatalities on our roadway. So our number one focus is safety. We are working with the communities, adopting safe systems approach to address the safety concerns, of especially the pedestrian and bicyclists on our roads. We're building more ADA accessible sidewalks. We're building more protected bike lanes. And we make sure that contractors have permits to be in our roadway. We'll also be looking at our transit reliability to improve the transit um, access through downtown to ensure that they can stay on schedule and, and meet the needs of residents throughout the city, not only in downtown. Our Traffic Management Center benefits transit by introducing TSP, Transit Signal Priority. This gives more green time as transit vehicles approach our signals to ensure that they can quickly and efficiently move through our major corridors. We touch more lives in this city than any other department or division. We maintain everything from the potholes on the streets, picking up litter, open up streets, roads, and right-of-ways for emergency vehicles and first responders. We're here for the citizens of Davidson County. Leading a Department of Public Works or any other kind of team takes a wide range of skills and experience. For individuals who've just now begun a leadership role, APWA is here to help. We caught up with some present and past members of the Emerging Leaders Academy to find out how. To be a leader in public works, you need to be about the people. Uh, leadership is about how we bring out the best in others. How do we bring out the most, best collective action? Um, we all come from very technical backgrounds. Um, but it's that leadership skills that really help us find solutions that are most effective for our communities. The APWA Emerging Leaders Academy is a group of 16 to 17 uh, newly uh, minted leaders within their organization that um, is a year-long program that uh, helps teach them soft skills that they don't necessarily get in their organizations. So it's breaking down what leadership means and that those are skills that we can all develop and practice and then the association gives you those opportunities to practice it really in a safe environment, which then applies to your career. And when I started at the ELA, I was a project manager and I'm now the executive director and I've gone up several, several levels, but I really rely on that experience I had through the association that helped me on that path for success to how to, um, how to lead a team. So the course starts with a kickoff session in Kansas City for, I believe it was three days. And it was really great because that's when we got to meet both the instructors in person and our classmates. And that's where we really were able to cement kind of our bond with the group. And then from there, we had monthly calls on different leadership topics led by the instructors. And then um, we also had a class project, which um, we have some really, really uh, talented people in our group who took the lead of that and we are excited to present it today. And it's really about um, the challenges in recruiting retain and retaining public works professionals. So when I was at uh, a district, I had just gone to the public side and when this um, program became available and I had done some leadership training on the, pub the, the private sector, a little different focus when you're on the public. And so recognizing what ethics looks like, having to deal with media, um, having to deal with a team that you don't always get to select, how do you bring out the best in other people, is really the foundation of what ELA is about. I learned a lot, even, even about myself as a, as a person, not just professionally, I think a lot, a lot of, just, just a lot of insight and reflection on a lot of the topics. Um, and it's, it's, been a, it's been a great, great experience. Um, the instructors, the breadth of knowledge they bring from the diverse work portfolios that they have, they were able to pull on a lot of their knowledge to, to tie in stories about leadership, to provide real world examples, um, which was really neat. And so we will definitely miss them. ELA will miss them, but there's a great group of new instructors coming in. So it's kind of a, a new turn in the ELA program. I was in the actual second class um, that graduated in 2009 in Columbus, Ohio. This program um, has really uh, shaped me and my professional career 
Uh, we are actually moving to two uh, classes next year with a group of new instructors that uh, was selected by the ELA subcommittee, which I'm currently chairing um, until next year. Um, and so we'll have 32 uh, individuals that we'll be selecting here in mid-September and for the first uh, double class of uh, APWA ELA. Yeah, I've taken a lot from this course back to my job. Actually, I we had a lot of team building activities in Kansas City and I took several of those back and had my whole division do them. One was, um, you had, to, you had specific instructions, everyone in the group had instructions and you had a bunch of Legos and you couldn't talk. So you couldn't explain what you were supposed to be doing in the activity and you had to figure out how to communicate. And um, that, was, that was a big hit at my work. I recommend this course to anyone that is eligible for it, um, which is 10 years less uh, public works experience or less than three years supervisory experience. If you fit within that criteria, you should put your application in. The, the application process opens every spring and is usually open for a couple of months. Then once that is closed, uh, the applications will go to the ELA subcommittee for review and ranking, and then they select the class from all of those submissions that's usually done in the fall. I would, I'd encourage anybody that had an interest, that even if they just think they might, um, to definitely apply for it. As long as you meet the requirements, you can do it. There's no, like, I'm, I'm not an engineer, um, so don't, don't let anything like that stop you from it. And it's, it's been a great, great experience. The people that graduate from ELA are the APWA's leaders of tomorrow, always have been and always will be. Make sure to get in touch with ELA to find out much more. Now to a public works division that's providing leadership in creating a thriving team and excellent customer service. Let's go to the city of Memphis. Public works is such a a uh, diverse organization that has lots of different services and our main goal is customer service serving serving the public and you know in, in this time you know, there's so much has changed in how we deliver services but it uh, the way that we have to deliver services requires unique methods and technology generally is um, it was advantageous way to achieve that that goal uh, and there's technology obviously changes dramatically um, very rapidly but it's also uh, such an amazing tool with so many diverse applications. So you kind of need to use it in any way you can to, to promote the goal and mission of Public Works. We keep ourselves uh, to a standard when we uh, collect data to ensure that we're uh, meeting the need of our customers and that we are, um, as a, a whole city entity, that we are doing what's necessary for Public Works to thrive. So we all work together in order to provide this seamless delivery of service for all citizens. And now it's time to stop by APWA's Diversity, Equity and Inclusion Brunch. We hear how the association is pushing to ensure all perspectives are heard and everyone feels included with benefits for all. A more inclusive future looks and feels a certain way. Um, in, in that sense, it looks like uh, people being welcome to all sorts of events in a variety of different mindsets and ideas around the work that we do. Diversity, equity, and inclusion is important to APWA and our industry as a whole because I believe our association needs to reflect the faces of our industry and in turn reflect the faces of our community that we serve. DEI is important because it's an opportunity to bridge gaps where there are deficiencies in areas that we don't actually have representation from things that are culturally, gender, socioeconomical. There are a lot of ways that we can bridge gaps by understanding one, we're more alike than we're different. And that when we become more inclusive and become a better organization, we can then serve the constituents and the population at large better. So today we're having the APWA um, Diversity, Equity and Inclusion Committee brunch, which is our annual tradition. It serves as a safe space for public works professionals to not only have some great food and great conversation, but learn more about diversity related topics. By breaking bread and by having an opportunity to make it as less, as least confrontational and more understanding, we can make it to better. Our long-term goals for DE&I is that our association starts to actually look and feel like the communities that we serve. The work that we do is inherently important. It impacts us as professionals, 
but also our communities. So we should also look like the communities that we serve. Last year, we had a major milestone for us to adopt a diversity, equity, and inclusion roadmap. This will create the short and long-term initiatives for us to really work on so that we can be more diverse, equitable, and inclusive, and in turn, really help us not only survive, but thrive into the future. We want to kind of lay the foundation to build upon so that the things and the guidelines and the initiatives that we set can be made applicable to any topic that has a DEI-centric theme and that can bring things together more cohesively together. A more inclusive public works helps us in the future because, in my opinion, by having representation, it's important to serve the community better. When I sit at a corner and want a permit, I want to make sure that I can see someone just like myself and really reflect the makeup of our community. So in my opinion, inclusivity is all about what we need to do into the future. Great support there to ensure all APWA members are included. And coming up, our in-depth interview on sustainability as we examine San Diego's vision for net zero, but first to Richmond, Virginia, where their public works department is working to make an already great place to live even more livable. Richmond is a dynamic, vibrant, great place to live. We are a city that is more welcoming. We are a city that's more diverse, a city where people feel like they belong. And we're this way now more than we've ever been. And I think it's because of the people who have moved to the city, but also we have a great base of legacy residents. When you put that mix together, uh, it makes for a very, very vibrant community with culture and with a lot of excitement. The role that the Department of Public Works plays is to make certain that our streets are as safe as possible, as well as that our neighborhoods and our streets and sidewalks are as clean as possible. And that's what we try to do for our citizens, to make certain that they have that to go through each and every day. We work behind the scenes, but we're so, so critical to the everyday lives and the everyday need of our communities. So when the folks look at the city of Richmond, they're looking for timely and effective and responsive and reliable service. It is the ambition of nations and cities all around the world, but achieving net zero emissions is a major challenge, even looking decades into the future. To discuss their plan to hit zero by 2035, we're joined by Heather Werner and Mashira Little right here in their home city of San Diego. Thank you two for joining us. Thanks for having us. To you, Heather, what is the ultimate goal? In 2015, the city passed our first climate action plan, and then we recently updated it in 2022 to establish a net zero target by 2035, and that effectively means that for every greenhouse gas we put into the air or into the water, we take an equivalent out. So our emissions goes to net zero in terms of either what we've reduced or what we've sequestered, what we've taken out. And we're using nature-based solutions, renewable energy, um, multiple different strategies in multiple different areas of the economy to hit those targets. If you could give one prime example. I, I would really just focus on the five strategies. Those are um, advancing our renewable energy, so getting all of our electricity to renewable energy, reducing our natural gas loads, so that's taking out natural gas from almost every aspect of the economy, increasing our natural resources to sequester more and transitioning all of our transportation sector over into electric vehicles or other zero emission technologies. And um, Mashira, how big of a challenge is it? Heather actually said a lot. Just hearing <laughs> her say that, I think everyone recognizes how big of a challenge it is. We are the eighth largest city in the U.S. So you, when you think about from a city perspective, you know, we have over 1,600 city facilities and actually over 4,500 city vehicles. So I think the challenge there and just recognizing the effort that the city has to uh, produce to meet these goals is a significant challenge. And we recognize that and we are leaning forward into that challenge to ultimately meet that goal of net zero by 2035. And where are we in terms of emissions at this point? So the last inventory we did was in 2019. Um, the last one we consider really valid because Obviously, COVID had a very big impact on lots of different economic sectors. And that was about 10.5 million metric tons of CO2 equivalent, so greenhouse gases. We've seen reductions in those years, and we're going to do another inventory in about a year to see how far we've come. Um, so we're on the right track, but we have a lot to get done between now and then. 
How hard is it to get buy-ins on this? Depends on the sector. Um, no, but actually the good thing for San Diego is because we passed our first climate action plan early, the idea of the city leading on climate action and bringing along all of the different stakeholder parties, all of the different industries, all the different economies, um, not only our own internal stakeholders, but across the city, um, has been a long and engaged conversation. We have really strong advocates. We have most of, um, almost all of our business sector really focused in this area. We have a massive clean tech sector actually here rooted in San Diego. So they drive a lot of the conversation. So I think San Diego has really made that transition into our entire economy really understanding that sustainability and net zero is a way to grow our economy and really advance the quality of life for San Diegans rather than something that's an add-on or something that um, creates more challenges. Well, let's talk about the fleet, if you could, uh, Mashira. Uh, what does it take to electrify? I think the biggest challenge that everybody kind of recognizes is the money. Where are we going to get the money to electrify over 4,500 vehicles that I talked about earlier? Um, but we are leaning into exploring and finding as many grant opportunities as we can. We're also looking into rebate programs with the industry, with both internal and external partners. The other thing is we have to have the additional electrical capacity at around the city and for our internal city vehicles at our operations yard. Uh, we actually just commissioned a plan, uh, a fleet electrification plan that a consultant helped us work together on, um, identifying where our vehicles are, what the life cycle of our vehicles are, determining whether we can do a two to one a ratio of charging and we have figured that not all our vehicles need to charge at night um, every day. It's all, also going to take all hands on deck. It's going to require some industry uh, input as well because you know we are have a plan right now for light duty vehicles but when the industry is you know it's a little bit slower producing the heavy duty and uh, medium duty um, electric vehicles for us. But what Michelle is talking about is we recognize that this level of transition, both for our buildings and for our fleet, is a massive capital upfront investment. And most cities, including San Diego, are not going to be able to do that on book. And so, yes, we're going after and talking to for state funds um, that will definitely be there, federal funds to be there. But the other is just the broader private capital markets. There is an acknowledgement throughout the capital markets that this is really where investment is going and this is really where the opportunity is. And so a lot of this is about making sure that we are designing contracts and partnerships with companies that can deliver long term, that can bring that capital forward and that you're really structuring what you would consider a win win for both parties in terms of our sustainability goals, our budget goals and um, obviously their revenue and kind of business goals. Why is it so important to approach our future with sustainability? Um, so you may have heard, we had a hurricane in California. We live the reality um, in San Diego and in California writ large of climate change. And that is things that have, have already baked in. And, and San Diego really, really kind of gets it from two ends. We have potential sea, re sea level rise that we know we have to take account of. And then we have increased wildfire risk. That's again, the, the climate change impacts that you're seeing now are baked in from emissions that were produced decades ago. So we have, we are really taking this from both a mitigation. So we want to reduce as fast as possible. So we're not adding to the problem and then a resiliency, which means we have to adapt for what we know is already baked in and do what we can to um, mitigate the impacts to the quality of life, to our buildings, to, to people and property. Um, and those really go hand in hand because the idea that business of you, as usual will somehow you'll be able to engineer your way out of this um, on the time frame that we know the science tells us isn't, isn't possible. We, we have to tackle this and we have to tackle it holistically end to end throughout the economy. Then again, 2035 is really right around the corner when you yes. think about it. And um, we are close, but not there yet. 
Do you think things can happen that fast to reach the goals? We're positive about reaching our goal. We actually, I think even before the 2015 cap, I think we've been working, at least on the fleet side for years, we have over 400 uh, hybrid vehicles in our fleet. We have 28 EVs and we're, I think we have 30 or more on order. So we've already been leaning into the effort, you know, to reduce emissions. Uh, the 2035 goal, that's 11 years from now. Uh, we're positive about it. It's a great challenge for us, but I, I would say it's doable. Yeah, I think that the hardest part of it actually is the culture shift. It's rooting that way of thinking into everything that we do. And again, San Diego prioritizes sustainability in all of our capital investments. We prioritize it in um, the services we do. It has really become a part of the city and the city's operations and the city's culture. And once you're there, the first time you do it, so it's gonna take twice as long and you'll run into challenges, et cetera, but you, that's just a lessons learned iteration and you gain speed and momentum the more you do. So is our pace now what it's gonna to need to be in six years? No, but we have to start now. And I think the biggest hurdle we've really been able to overcome because I don't have to talk to any of our other departments I don't even have to talk to most people in the city when we're talking to them about what we're doing, why we're doing it, and why it's important. Um, this is all conversations about the how. It's no longer any more conversations about if. Well, it sounds at least like San Diego is becoming a leader for change for the rest of the state. We are doing our best. Yes. Thank you. Thank you, Michelle and Heather. Very um, enlightening conversation. Thank you. Thank you. We, we come every year to the uh, APWA conferences and man, it's just, it's just a wonderful learning experience. You get to see all the new technology. I come from a community of 100,000 folks and just seeing what people are doing in much greater cities and things for us to account for and plan for in the future. I think it's important to get exposed to how other people do things and, and kind of commiserate with those who can struggle with the same issues. Well, we've gotten to see a lot of our old friends. This has really been nice to see everybody and, and uh, get caught up on what they're doing. Uh, we just went into the exhibitor's uh, pavilion and so uh, learning all about all the various uh, products and services out there has been really exciting. Uh, my favorite part of the conference has certainly been just learning about public works. And when I see crews or learn about what's going on in my little town, uh, I'm gonna be much more appreciative of the work that they're doing. I think it's the people, the networking, that you get everybody in one, one gathering. Very informative, uh, as always. I've uh, been a member of APWA now for almost 30 years. It's the best professional organization I've ever been a part of. It has indeed been a great meeting. The PWX TV team has been thrilled to be here, getting to hear some of those great stories from the world of public works. Though we're at the end of our last show, there is plenty more to get out of PWX TV. In addition to our three episodes from PWX 2023, you will also find all our interviews online. PWX TV is also home to extended features from across the country, looking at public works departments and the great work they do. So make sure to head online as soon as you get home and watch and share it all. From sunny San Diego to the Peach State, PWX heads to Atlanta next year. We hope to see you there. And in the meantime, keep up the great work. You can tell us about it all in 2024.